This is Jacobin Radio. I'm Susie Wiseman. On today's show, we're going to look at the continuing multiple crises and challenges brought by the coronavirus pandemic. Employment, markets, production, and distribution worldwide are practically at a standstill, and the normal way of doing things through the capitalist market has shown itself to be incapable of responding adequately to deal with the needs of the moment to protect the population. We begin with James K. Galbraith at the University of Texas in Austin. He has written an article in The Nation about the mobilization that must start now, and we're going to get his views on why the economy as organized now has been unable to sufficiently respond and what concrete measures need to be taken to meet the challenges from here. We're then going to talk to Aaron Beninov at the University of Chicago. He writes about employment and especially the irregular, informal, and precarious forms of employment that characterize work today. Aaron has just published an article on the cataclysmic unemployment resulting from the essential shutdown of the American economy, and we'll get his ideas and his findings. All this when Jacobin Radio returns in just a moment. Welcome to Jacobin Radio. I'm Susie Wiseman. And as we continue in our look at what the coronavirus pandemic is doing to all of us and to the economy, I'm really pleased to have with us James K. Galbraith. He teaches at the University of Texas in Austin, and he's the author most recently of two books that came out pretty much at the same time, Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know. And the other one is Welcome to the Poison Chalice, The Destruction of Greece and the Future of Europe. And he's also writing pretty much everywhere right now. And you can catch his articles in The Guardian, at INET, uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, and The Nation. And we're going to be talking a little bit about all of them, but especially the article in The Nation that is titled The Mobilization That Must Start Now. Beautifully written article and incredibly practical. So welcome, first of all, uh, Jamie Galbraith to the show. Thank you very much. So pleased to have you. And I just wanted to say, because right at the very beginning, it seems like speaking in the grossest, super simplified terms in your nation article, which again is called the mobilization that must start now, you're saying that to respond to the enormous crisis and disruption that's brought on by the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we need to move from essentially our market economy to, and I put it in quotes, a planned economy, or at least one that instructs and allocates in a way. So perhaps one way to have you elaborate your article would be to hone in on the things about our neoliberal capitalist economy, the key features of it uh, that have left it so impotent in responding to the challenge of this pandemic, and then how we have to consciously politically restructure our economy to carry out the key tasks that need to be accomplished uh, to protect and help people. And that begins, of course, with our medical system. So let's just begin with me once again saying capitalism has shown itself to be incredibly not effective in dealing with this. And normally, you know, we think of capitalism as effective in getting things done efficiently and meeting people's needs, or at least their wants, if not their needs. And basically that's done through competition and supply and demand. So what are the big points and that you see it having fallen short in this present crisis? And why has the market been so systematically unable to do the job that's needed? Well, I think the way to think about this is that it is the efficiency of the system that we developed that is also its vulnerability. That's also the source of fragility in the face of a crisis of the kind that we're now experiencing. Uh, Over many years, uh, we have run a system which has, uh, among other things, extended the supply chain to take advantage of the least expensive sources of raw materials and of basic manufacturing. And we've moved and offshored a lot of what we used to do here in the, in the United States. We've globalized. We have also become very, very dependent on a very volatile financial sector and we, in terms of how business operations are organized and what kind of incentives they respond to. So there's volatility, there's an orientation to the short term. But most of all, there is this drive to minimize costs and to maximize profits. That's a competitive reality, a competitive imperative, if you like, in 
ordinary functioning times, on ordinary times, it generates a system which has a lot of inequality, but nevertheless delivers a lot of goods. And then we find that, that this is not what we need in the current situation. We find that you know, we're effectively being transformed overnight to what most resembles a wartime basis. And on a wartime basis, though, things that, that you advantage you in the previous period are, are disadvantages. What you need to have are compact supply chains and a dedication to deliver the goods to the people who actually are the most essential people in the uh, in meeting the challenge. Uh, so uh, just as in a war, you need to get ammunition and uh, weaponry and planes and tanks and so forth to the front lines. In this situation, you need to get the ventilators and the masks and the beds and the ICU units and the staff to the medical front lines. Uh, And just as in a war, you need to supply troops and their support operation with provisions. And this situation, the most important priority after the medical supply is to make sure that the whole population has access to the basic provisions that it needs. And we're seeing this is, 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 is crumbling and breaking down at every level practically, except in some places where we have local administrations or state administrations, which are, you know, have administrative capacity and are doing their best to meet these challenges. But it's exceedingly, exceedingly difficult to do this unless you have at the federal level a government which is addressing these questions in a thoughtful and correct way and with the urgency that they require. That's precisely what we've lacked. And as you lack it, the fact that this is a disease which grows very rapidly on an exponential basis means that you'd fall behind and the challenges for the medical system become ever more intense. We're experiencing that now. We certainly are. And of course, it, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking that we have a president with authoritarian urges, but just in the face of this crisis, he's not exercising those except in the sort of PR sense and having these uh, constant press conferences. But what you're saying in a way, Jamie Galbraith, is that we, right now, what we don't need is this sort of spontaneity of the market, but a conscious prioritization of our needs from the top to the bottom in terms of their importance and the plans about how we go to, you know, deal with those things one by one. And starting from, I guess, where we are is a a shocking kind of state of unpreparedness. And especially uh, now, and as you say in your articles, the most pressing problem right now is the health system. And that's where you start. And so what do you see as the key thing to be done there? You've proposed, you know, in your nation article, the Reconstruction Health Corporation. So maybe you could elaborate on all of that. What we're seeing uh, in the news right now is a critical problem in the supply chains for medical provisions. We're seeing that uh, states are being outbid by the federal government. They're bidding against each other, states, localities, and hospitals. There are reports that uh, you know, people are scrambling with whatever money they have available to get masks and ventilators, and there's no coordination here. And what you need in this circumstance is to have a, an authority that, that is trusted, recognized, that can take the supplies and allocate them without regard to the uh, capacity to pay. Uh, There was a story in the press a couple of days ago about uh, how in the rural communities in the state of Maine, and I imagine this is true elsewhere, uh, because people are sheltering in place, the emergency rooms are empty because people are not not getting injured and they're waiting for the onslaught of the COVID-19 patients. And uh, as a result, the hospitals don't have the revenues to keep their staff. So they're laying people off. Uh, This is absolutely crazy. You need to have a full federalization of the cost structure. And then you have all kinds of stories about how the private health insurance system, which is not good even in the best of times, uh, is not able to handle, is not able to process claims, is not able to get people who are in the hospital ready to leave out of the hospitals. There's some reports about that. And it With massive numbers of people, many millions being laid off and going on unemployment insurance, they're at the same time having to adjust their health insurance. Uh, This is a a dysfunctional system. All of these things need to be placed on a wartime footing, which means you provide as needed and you allocate as supplies are available where they're most urgently needed with the objective of keeping a step ahead of the surges in cases that are coming in. For that, let me come to the question of what uh, Mike Lind and I recommended already yeah. now uh, three weeks or so ago, uh, was that you do what they did in the Depression, actually enacted uh, under the Hoover administration, so in the Republican era, and then greatly expanded by Roosevelt, which was to create 
called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. We say that this is a health finance corporation, basically a wholly owned government corporation, which gets these decisions out of the hands of the administration and also the Congress, uh, which takes a long time to make these decisions and often doesn't decide things in a sensible way, puts them under competent control with with oversight, uh, and also allows for essentially unlimited funding uh, so that they have direct access to the government's borrowing power. They can issue bonds and get the money and the resources to where they need to be. That's what the RFC did. Uh, One of the great things the RFC did in the war was to create the synthetic rubber industry, the second largest industry created in World War II after the atomic bomb, after the Manhattan Project. It was a reconstruction finance corporation project. What we have here is not really on the same scale. This is not World War II. Uh, But from an urgency standpoint, it is even more urgent because we had months to prepare for going to full combat in World War II. And we only have days now. So this needs to have happened. It should happen with the next phase. Uh, and it's still needed because this absolutely this supply chain is, is turning into a debacle. You can see this in the press. I was just going to say there, too, because we've seen that Ireland responded by nationalizing its health care system. So it did, yes. And this, of course, they had a, a real hodgepodge. And it's interesting because in the south of Ireland, it was different than in the north, which had the national health system of Britain. And so people really noticed this big difference. And now, of course, they responded to the crisis by saying, OK, we just have to nationalize. What you're recommending, I think, well, I'm going to ask, is this somewhat akin to that? And we even saw this week that Trump has made the statement that, you know, maybe Medicare for all or expanding Medicaid isn't such a bad idea now and made me think think, my God, is it possible that it would take a Republican like Trump to actually get to that? Or is that just fancy thinking? Fancy I'm, thinking. I'm open to the redemption of any sinner uh, <laughs> who is willing to play a leadership role in this. I, I, I saw on another matter, which is doing the right thing by people so who, who need to stay home, which is a very much larger share of the population. But Josh Hawley, Republican senator from Missouri, has advocated for payroll replacement, which is clearly the right thing to do. Having firms cut their workers off and put them on unemployment insurance, even though it's quite generous under the emergency provisions, is very inefficient. They have to have an enroll, have to enroll. That's the systems are have been having difficulty absorbing the, the demand. And then they're off their health insurance and the employers may uh, want to not bring them back. Uh, so this is good for the companies. It gets them off their costs, but not good for the economy, not good for the society. Much better to say, you're still on payroll and we'll repay the companies for the cost of keeping exactly. you at home. Uh, and it doesn't have to be 100%. People's costs are down. They're not going out. They're not buying things. There's nothing to buy except food. So if you gave them you know, 80%, which is the Hawley proposal, or even 75%, which is what the Danes are doing, it'd be all right. And everybody would stay, stay safe and sound. And then you have to make provision for the people who are not on payroll. Another aspect, uh, just to come back if I could on the supply chain, yeah, is, yeah. Uh, you know, this second big area is making sure that provision Provisions continue to flow. Right. And all of these people who have been the worst treated workers in America, the checkout clerks and the stockers and the warehouse workers and so forth, they're now the frontline essential people. And they need to, first of all, they need to have their health care covered and their and have adequate protections. And then they need to be paid uh, so that they, it's worth it to them to stay on that job uh, so that these supplies continue to flow. Uh, and it look, so- yeah, it look even worse is the food bank situation, which is food banks re- rely on contributions and gifts from the from the stores, which are with the best will in the world are out of stock because people have been emptying the shelves and they rely on volunteers who are mostly older and therefore mostly sheltering. So there needs to be a provision for people who rely on food banks right now because the numbers are going up dramatically as we speak. You just said two things, Jamie Galbraith, and I want to go into both of them. First, that the workers now who are deemed essential workers are, in fact, the ones that are in the lowest paid category and those who had no organizing clout. And yet we're seeing wildcat strikes and one day strikes, which seem to be extremely effective. And it it just made me think that these are the workers that now have social weight, as maybe railroad workers or communications workers did in earlier periods of history. Now you have, you know, these essential warehouse workers and grocery workers and deliveries being the ones that have this social weight. So there's one, this is that aspect. And in some ways, hopefully their employers will be shamed uh, into giving them not just temporary $2 more an hour like Amazon, but 
more and maybe the clout would be there. And then the second thing is that, you know, the way that supplies are running out, and this is a really important part of your article in The Nation, where you talk about the secondary areas like medicine, paper goods, cleaning goods, all very, very important. And, you know, I saw some joke going around that who knew toilet paper would be the new currency. It's really hard to even imagine why they disappeared at the rate that they did and how they're not being replenished. So, but are you seeing in terms of what you're saying for having the government essentially allocate resources, production and distribution, that these would also be included in that? Not yet. No, I I don't think that's necessary. And and, uh, to get to your first point about the workers, I think the important thing is to get ahead of that curve. I mean, obviously, one has to support these workers and their demands because they're justified Mm -hmm. demands for medical care, for protections on the job, for masks and plexiglass barriers and so forth for people who are interacting with customers and for better pay. Uh, But get ahead of that. Uh, Let's not have the the need for the strikes. Let's recognize that, that the whole dynamic has changed. Uh, and that we have to deal with that and essentially on a long-term basis because this problem isn't going to go away. And the catastrophe that will be upon us if the stores can't be manned or if their goods won't come into them where people are afraid to go in because of the c- contamination possibilities, you don't want that to happen. I do think that there are responsible distributors and responsible retailers out there and who are doing their best or doing as well as they can imagine doing under these circumstances. They're they're allocating goods. They're saying, you know, you can only buy two of this or two of that and that long list. They're trying to keep the supply chains open. I do think that the people who are doing this work have a strong professional attitude and the truckers are keeping those trucks coming in. And I say, you know, this is what citizens do in a crisis. Uh, And so we have to respect that and, and mobilize it and then deal with the lapses that occur. And where we have to really be harsh is with profiteers and with middlemen yeah. and with this kind of people who are commandeering supplies. And we have to make sure that people are calm enough so that they they don't go out and panic responses of stocking up and hoarding as though this is going to go on for six months. Uh, right. That's not, the, that's not that's an asocial way to behave. So keeping the people calm and keeping the supply chains running, lots of ways of doing that without fully nationalizing, but it does require that everybody be pulling in the same direction and that people who aren't get uh, that that be responded to very quickly and effectively. And I just want to say, because in the article, in The Nation, you you quickly move from the top priorities for production, from there to distribution, and you've just mentioned that, uh, transportation and logistics. How do you, you know, see that sort of playing out in your reasoning in, in making that a very top priority? Well, the, the basic perception here is that we don't know how long this is going to go on. Uh, and a large part of the population has to be basically at home during this time, which means when they go out, it's going to be to the grocery store, it's going to be to the pharmacy. And they're not going to restaurants or theaters or you know other things, and they're not going to work, and they're not producing a lot of things that are not necessary at the same time. Now, this could be six weeks, could be two months. We don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, So we need to prepare for Mm -hmm. the possibility that this is a a long-term or recurring of situation. And if we open up a little bit at some point because things are okay, and then we have recurrences, which are likely second waves are already being seen, we need to be able to to be in a position at that point to respond to that selectively but effectively. And that means you need to have a system in place. You need to know. And that that becomes a kind of of continuing proposition for, I think, basically, if we're going you know, to plan it out for the, as though it were indefinite. If it's not indefinite, great. But my view is that once this is over, I and mean, once this recedes, it's never going to be over entirely. The fact that it happened is going to cause a very big reorganization, necessary, a very big reorganization. We're going to need a much more effective and much better resourced public health system uh, that's able to accommodate surges of this kind. We're going to need health monitoring. In China, you can't go into a building now without without getting your temperature checked. That requires people. And those people are going to have to be paid. So there are all kinds of activities. And other activities like the airlines and the restaurants and, and anything that, that's a crowd scene is going to have to be reorganized in some way to make you know, some of this experience viable from an economic point of view. So a lot of things that we thought were, were normal before are not going to be uh, normal afterwards. We really have to think about how, start thinking about how to organize things. And I would go one more step, just to, which is that there are going to be a pile of debts, an enormous pile of debts. 
people are, who can't pay their rent, can't pay their mortgage, can't pay their utility bills, and they need that money for food. Now, you can mitigate some of that by getting money out to people. It's very imperfect. It's not going to It's not going to help people who are undocumented. It's not going to help people who aren't tax filers. It's kind of, you know, lots of people are going to be in trouble on this. And you know, the fact is, the way to think about this is these are all allies in the effort, and allies do not charge each self in emergencies. I'd those love are, to pick up on yeah. almost all of those, if you don't mind, sure. because you just, even starting with debt, because we've seen, of course, in this campaign, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and others have talked about debt cancellation for student debt, which is preventing this next generation from actually, you know, beginning a productive life because they're sure. still tied to paying for their education throughout their lives. So, and you're talking about having to deal with debt and some of the demands that we've seen coming forward is not just a a moratorium on evictions, but a moratorium on bills of some sort. And the other side of it is that we've seen the federal government step up and open up, you know, the coffers to a lot of money. So it's really kind of changed, I think, a lot of people's perception about what is possible. And you just mentioned that a lot of these measures that will be put into place now will forever change people's perceptions of what government can or can't do. So given that, can you just kind of perhaps elaborate on some of these, the way, maybe even looking at how in history, after the Great Depression, for example, people's attitudes changed toward what these things, and do you see that as the situation now? Well, sure. After the crash in 1929, there were four years in which basically nothing moved. And when things started moving again, it was because the Roosevelt administration coming in in 1933 and setting off an entire vast array of projects and giving people work to do and things like the Civilian Conservation Corps, giving construction projects all over the country and through the WPA and you know, practically anything that you can name uh, that comes from that era was funded by the uh, the, the Bay Bridge and uh, it was, it was a New Deal project, just just for example. And the, right outside my window, the Texas Tower was a New Deal project. And in New York, the Triborough Bridge, and I think it was the Lincoln Tunnel were New Deal projects. And the vast range of things in between, 600,000 miles of roads were paved in that period. Airfields were built, a thousand of them. Every school was rebuilt, every rural school county courthouses. You can go around that there's a wonderful inventory of these things that are still there. And they they were very much part of the fabric of American life. So we learned how that could do it be done. And then Reconstruction Finance Corporation was a major force in this and not necessarily not the only one, but a very big one. And again, in, in the Second World War, we doubled the size of the economy in four years under extreme pressure. And half of that, I mean, well, the, essentially the parallel economy was entirely the war effort. And so it, we know that this is possible and it's what history and experience tell us. Uh, and uh, what we're facing now is the first time that real necessity of putting that knowledge to, to work. And people say, well, what about debts? You know, you know, the Tea Party came out in 2010. I don't want to pay that other guy's mortgage. And that wasn't a really good case, but you could make it. You could say, uh, well, these people shouldn't have signed those mortgages and uh, you know, they should have read the fine print and so on and so forth. And they had a good time in those houses. Uh, that's not a very fair argument, but people made it. You can't make that argument now. Right now, nobody who is affected by this is to blame for it. Nobody. Everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. They're staying at home. So they need to be maintained, and that needs to be made possible for the health of everybody else. It's people who are dumped out on the street, people who have to scavenge for food, are a contagion risk. They're, it's bad for them, but it's also bad for anybody they encounter. It's bad for the capacity of the health system. It's undermining the hospitals. So this has to be done as a common effort. There's no question about it. And people say, I can't be penalized for it afterwards. They won't accept it. I was called by a reporter the other day who said, well, you know, there's some hedge funds who think they're going to be have a great time scooping up distressed assets. And my reaction to that is, good luck, fellows. You're not going to escape yeah. the pitchforks this time, and nor should you. Uh, this has got to be free, frozen. There's some constructive ideas. I mean, one thing I'd suggested on that article and else was that just basic communications bills and broadband in people's homes, those bills, the government, let the government pay 50 bucks a, a month to the in, communication companies to provide that free to everybody, every household. 
because people need to stay home. And this is a, you know, 50 bucks is not a great deal of money, but it's, it's better than nothing. It's adds something to their, to the reserves and it doesn't discriminate against the undocumented or anybody, it just anybody who has broadband gets the benefits. Great. As an idea. And there's some, I know there's some work in Congress and there's some interest in this in Congress and it should be moved very quickly. And then you need to freeze foreclosures, evictions, utility stoppages, anything that would undermine the public health effort has to be frozen. And then you deal with the problem afterwards. I, can't I, I just wanted to come in just, and before, before we yeah. end it, we have about time for one more question. But yeah. on this digital divide that exists between not just in cities, but in rural America and mm-hmm. elsewhere, many people, I mean, I was looking for a cousin of mine who's unemployed, does not have internet. And the cheapest you could find was like 50 bucks a month. And he's not going to find that 50 bucks a month. But the other side of it is as the public schools closed down here in Los Angeles, 15,000 students disappeared. And what that means is they went home to houses that don't have internet and don't have laptops. And these are young kids. And it's really a scandal. And as you say, this is something that, you know, maybe people will now demand of the government. But this brings me to my last question, uh, James Galbraith, because you lay out so many good prescriptions about what can and should be done. But we're also in a time of social distancing and quarantine. And normally the way that people press their government is to mobilize, get out out in the streets, demand. And and those are precisely the things that we can't do right now. We have to do it in a different way, let's say. And so your article is, We Must Mobilize Now. I think that's not the exact title, but something like that. What are your ideas about how people can pressure even this government to do the right thing and then to make it permanent? At least some of them. Well, I have to use the communications tools that we have, and we have to use them uh, by whatever means. And that, those are basically electronic. And you're right; it, this is a challenge. Uh, you know, this is a challenge. We need somehow to figure out how to meet, and we need to get those people who are who are out there who are grasping this question. And I do believe there are governors, there are mayors. These are we have competent people in this country who are rising to this any kind of con- support and constructive criticism and that they can receive, I think would be welcome and, and helpful. And, and what you say about broadband, of course, points out in the long run, there are going to be lots of things that we're going to need to do that can be done even in an environment where there's still considerable risk. Stringing out broadband and building that out so that we have a system nationwide that's as good as South Korea's is something we should do. Getting up to speed on wireless is something we should do. And getting those costs down so people can afford them uh, is something we should do. And then you can think about, we're not going to have the same airline and travel sector that we had before. And we're going to need a lot more in the way of, uh, of renewable energy. And so getting people out there and building building out that capacity is something what, that one can do. Uh, and that, that gives you kind of a long-term perspective for investment and employment and and, and reorganization that will enable us to actually live lives that are that are good lives, but they won't be in the same pattern that we've been experiencing up to now. And, and we need to get used to that. I mean, there are many things that are just not coming back, not because, because people won't have the money and they won't have the desire. They will, they will have changed their attitudes once this is over because this is a learning experience for all of us. No question about that. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, James Galbraith. And I'd love to have you back because as we move into what should have been the political convention season over the summer that's now being postponed or will be changed, I'd love to get your ideas then and seeing how the political class rises to the challenge of the needs of the moment, which will be a a great um, subject for another interview. Uh, Thanks thanks so much. Thanks. And uh, James Galbraith teaches at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, Go out and look at his latest books, Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know, or Welcome to the Poison Chalice. And then he's also got the article that we talked the most about today, the mobilization that must start now in the nation. And you can also check out his articles in The Guardian and at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. James Galbraith, thanks for joining us today. And I'm Susie Weitzman. Thank you. Don't go away. Welcome back to Jacobin Radio. I'm Susie Wiseman. We're going to continue our look at the crises, multiple continuing crises and challenges that are being brought uh, by the coronavirus 
pandemic. And I'm very pleased to have Aaron Beninoff with us. He's at the University of Chicago, and he writes about employment and especially the irregular and formal and precarious forms of employment that characterize employment today. And he's just published an article called Crisis and Recovery on PhenomenalWorld.com. And that's from the Jane, J-A-I-N family Institute. And it's uh, called, as I said, Crisis and Recovery. And it's really an article about the cataclysmic unemployment that's resulting from this essential shutdown of the American economy. And we're going to get Aaron's ideas and findings. Aaron, welcome to Jacobin Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And I'm really pleased to do it now and hopefully many more times in the future. And as I mentioned, Aaron is, I guess, in the last year of of his tenure at the University of Chicago, and he'll be going off to Berlin. Well, depending on the state of the world pandemic, perhaps exactly when that's going to happen. But Aaron has just submitted a manuscript that will be published by Verso in October called Automation and the Future of Work. And he uh, has a series on automation in the in two issues of the New Left Review. But today we're going to be talking about uh, this cataclysmic drop in employment, uh, a sort of spectacular uh, new reality with the world economy practically at a standstill. So Aaron, maybe you could just begin by giving us an idea of the scale of this crisis, um, you know, what the uh, employment level was like, say, you know, last week before or two weeks ago before 10 million more people in the U.S. signed up for unemployment and, and what is projected? Hmm. Yeah, you know, Susie, that's a great question. Um, one of the big problems is that the crisis now is just moving far too fast for the standard statistical tools that the government has. So uh, just on Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released its report based on surveys. Um, And generally, those reports capture the true unemployment rate much better than than jobless claims, which you you mentioned. Uh, Because it turns out that in America, many people who are unemployed, they never apply for, never receive um, unemployment benefits. And we can can talk more about that. But in any case, um, this BLS report the, the surveys they conducted were conducted earlier in March. And uh, so the official unemployment rate that's going on in the books right now for the U.S. for March is just 4.4%, um, which is a 0.9% increase over February's rate, which was a very historic low of 3.5%, though it actually hid a lot of the unemployment, as it were, that remained in the U.S. economy. Um, in any case, 4.4% is just so low compared to what we know the true unemployment mu- rate must be already. So 10, 10 million people, as you said, filed for unemployment in the last two weeks. Um, that alone should have raised the unemployment rate by more than 6%. So even just with what we know, the unemployment rate should be well over 10% now, but it's impossible to say what its actual level is or how high it will go. Estimates are that in April, it could be as high as 20%, even 30%. So we're just going to have to wait and see. And certainly this is unprecedented, right? Even in the at the height of the Depression in the 1930s, it was what? Did it got to almost a third of the, uh, so of the workforce? You know what's so funny? I didn't get to include this in my article, but um, no one really knows how high unemployment was during the Great Depression because a lot of our tools for measuring unemployment come out of debates about how big the 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 population of the unemployed was at that time. So our, our measure of unemployment didn't really come into existence until 1938, 1940 is when the measures start. So there are estimates of, you know, 25 to 30 percent unemployment during the Great Depression. But a lot of that is based on limited information. We really just don't know um, the true extent of it. Well, and you just mentioned, and I think, can we just take a minute now? Because uh, we've done this a lot on this program and talked about how uh, how little the uh, unemployment rate actually tells us about what's really going on in the economy. And you write a lot about precarious mm-hmm. labor, gig labor. Then there's those who stop looking for work, those, those in prisons, undocumented. If if we were to have some sort of a realistic count, do you have any idea of what it would really be like before this catastrophic drop? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I feel like the thing about the unemployment rate is that it's a way of trying to summarize 
what's going on in the labor market in one single number. And uh, it's, it's sort of um, the way that the economy has developed over the past 50 years has made it really hard to summarize in a single number. I would say if you're going to look at one number, it should be like the, um, the labor share of income, like the actual amount of uh, uh, the share of all the GDP of all the income in the country that goes to labor. And so you can watch that fall. That tells you something really about the demand for labor in the economy. But as far as trying to add up, you know, all of the people um, experiencing precarity, whether they're employed or unemployed or whether they've dropped out of the labor force, we can sort of begin to provide measures of each of these in turn. But it's very hard to try to summarize them uh, into a single statistic. Okay, so but let's go then from there into some of the area that you cover in your article on crisis and recovery that appears at Phenomenal World. Dot com, and that's to talk about how the pandem- pandemic hit the U.S. economy, not in the robust, strong state that the business press and pundits would have us believe, but one that was already quite weak. And, and maybe you could just talk about that in terms of employment and living standards uh, on the eve of the pandemic and then, you know, what's happened since, let's say, two thousand seven through nine at the time of the great recession. Yeah. So, um, the, the last business cycle from the great financial crisis to 2019, and I'm here assuming that, uh, that's now over and we're entering a pretty deep recession. That means we can kind of look back over the business cycle and get a sense of how things went in the last, um, the last cycle as it were of the U S economy. And the numbers are pretty bad. So, um, this was uh, the longest business cycle, like the longest recovery without a recession in U.S. history. And um, it was, in fact, like incredibly weak as a cycle. So the, the average growth rate over the course of um, the period since the financial crisis was very low uh, compared to past business cycles. And it's been secularly slowing down over a number of decades um, it's certainly far below it, it, the economy grew at a rate of on average, including the financial crash, 1.7% per year, uh, between 1948 and 1973, it grew at an average rate of 4% per year. So that's like, gives you a sense of how slowly the economy was growing. And just for that reason, um, it just had a lot, the economy did not create jobs very quickly. So I have a graph in my article, just pointing out that if you look at the history of unemployment, like a chart of the rise and fall of the unemployment rate, you'll see that in the early post-war period, unemployment rate, it would look like just a narrow spike, like the unemployment rate would shoot up and then it would quickly recover. And then there'd be a long period of recovery uh, after that. In the, in recent business cycles, um, the unemployment rate shoots up, but it just takes so long for the unemployment rate to recover. Uh, it just took, this was essentially so they say a jobless recovery because it just took so long um, for the labor market to recover. And what that means is that workers were struggling, families, households were struggling to get by for, you know, seven, eight, nine years um, before the labor market was starting. And after such a long period of growth, it was only just barely beginning. You were seeing the first faint glimmers of tightness in the labor market. And that's incredible. It just suggests the um, incredible weakness of the U.S. economy going into this crisis. And it also suggests by turn that um, unless there's a really dramatic change in politics uh, now, you're going to see another very long, long drawn out jobless recovery. And that's going to be very difficult. Um, for working class families in America. And maybe you could just, you know, tiny go into a tiny bit more there, Aaron Beninoff, because, um, you know, of course, we've been hearing nothing but a chorus in terms of the uh, cable news and the, and the business press that uh, prior to this stage, we had the most people, you know, the lowest unemployment on record. And yet we've also had wage stagnation. And as you said, yeah. you know, wages started to creep up a teeny bit but not bad. And then and maybe you could just talk a little bit about what those wages were and the kind of jobs that most people were employed in in, in that economy. Or this economy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the U.S. economy obviously just continues to create a lot of low wage 
uh, insecure jobs. Um, those are the kind of jobs that are available to people. Um, people really don't see uh, raises in their jobs um, in, in real terms. And there's just been an incredible degree of wage stagnation in the U.S. economy now for, for almost 50 years. And, and the way that that works just in recent periods as compared to the past is that in the past, over the course of the whole recovery, most workers would see their wages rise in real terms over the course of like a large part of the boom period. Um, this is, you know, before the 1970s. And with increasing severity since then, uh, workers' wages only increase really at the very tail end in the final years of the business cycle. And what we saw this time around, I have a little graph of this in my article, is that um, <clears throat> just in nominal terms, uh, in nominal terms, so not even adjusting for inflation, the rate of wage increase was just so low. Uh, it never hit 4%. And in the 90s, towards the tail end of the business cycle, wages grew at 4% a year. At the tail end of even the, the, the period right before the great financial crash, nominal wages grew at 4% per year at the end of the crisis, at the end of the, the boom. And in this case, they never reached that at all. And it was the longest recovery. So it's incredible. It, it indicates such a degree of weakness. And the reason, as you were indicating, is just that um, during the financial crash, so many people dropped out of the labor market. And when they drop out, the reason why the unemployment rate had become so inadequate as a measure of the true labor market slack is that so many people um, were discouraged from looking for work and they just simply dropped out. They stopped looking for work. And as soon as they do that, they're no longer counted in the numbers. It's so absurd. Uh, yeah. And so what's happened over the past essentially um, 10 years is that just in 2018, 2019, we were starting to see a recovery of the labor force participation rate. Just at the very end of that, uh, the number of people working, uh, or the share anyway, of the, of the prime age population that was working was just barely beginning to recover uh, its, its pre-great financial crisis rates. And so it's, a, it's an incredible degree of weakness in the economy. So let's take it from there to where we are right now, because what we've seen, you know, and, and it's worldwide, but we're looking, especially at the U.S., is that the economy is practically at a standstill. It's not completely at a standstill, but we've never seen anything like this before. And we're really in uncharted territory uh, in terms of um, unemployment and everything else in, in, in the corona pandemic. And. I'd like you to kind of break it down where we are. I think you're saying that you do it in thirds in terms of who's working, who's working at home, and who is working without support. Maybe you could just, you know, kind of elaborate. Yeah. So we get an idea of how vulnerable, as if we didn't know it in practice. Uh, let's hear it from you. How vulnerable is the world economy right now, and especially the U.S. one? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it would be a much longer story to talk about the world economy, um, and I'd be happy to do that. But just in the in the case of the U.S., um, there's been a number of estimates, some by the Federal Reserve economists and by other economists, just trying to figure out what the labor market looks like right now. And so I've just combined a few different estimates um, in mind just to give people a kind of working metric, you know, very inaccurate or, or very approximate in any case. Um, but, you know, that uh, roughly a third of Americans seem to be in jobs that they can do from home or salaried workers who can work from home. Um, a third of Americans, maybe even less, are uh, still forced to go to work. And that means that they're working under dangerous conditions. We've seen um, recently labor actions um, at Amazon and at Instacart protesting and in hospitals protesting the lack of protective mm. uh, equipment that people need. And so people are really putting themselves in danger as essential workers. Uh, that maybe is about a third of the workforce. And that leaves a, a last third either already unemployed or um, or soon to be unemployed. Now, you know, we have no idea how those numbers are actually going to shake out. It's going to take, as I said, the statistical apparatuses are so slow. They're, they, they're used to dealing with crises that unfold over a much longer period of time. So there's a really big lag right now uh, in the numbers. Just speaking comparatively, I'm very worried about um, what's going to happen around the world. I mean, we're just only beginning to see uh, what the 
COVID-19 pandemic looks like in a country like Brazil or Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And and we're just going to have to see what that looks like. I I read an article um, just this week that said that the rate of capital flight from um, so-called emerging markets is, is, is happening at four times the pace that it did uh, during the the last financial crisis. So that situation could be very bad. It seems like the relevant comparison is to um, European countries where they've instituted these Kurzarbeit policies, uh, which were first adopted in Germany, these short time policies where governments are making up um, a substantial part of workers' wages. So in, in Germany, about 70% uh, in in uh, Denmark, mm-hmm. seventy five, and in the UK, taking a kind of surprising uh, move, even eighty percent of workers' wages, um, and that is a policy designed to keep people in their jobs. Now, it's not really clear how successful that will be because even if states help businesses pay their workers' wages, these are businesses that are just seeing no revenue whatsoever um, at the moment. Like you know, film, uh, movie theaters and restaurants are just seeing no, no revenue at all. And it's not clear how many of them will be able to survive, even if they have some of their costs met. Right. Um, uh, but in any case, in the U S, um, we, we haven't, there's a part of the cares act that does something like this. It offers small businesses loans that become grants if they use it to pay wages, but clearly it's coming far too little too late. Uh, and so, um, you know, we're already seeing mass layoffs. And now now kind of moving up as well, we're seeing mass layoffs at some larger companies now too. So let's go there, Aaron Beninoff, because <clears throat> I was going to ask that question. In the U.S., we chose not to do, I guess, what would you call it, subsidizing uh, the wage bill, essentially, for all mm-hmm. of the, for the whole country. And by doing so, even if it, we ask the employers to continue the payroll and then the U.S. government presumably would pay the employers, it would keep people on the books. And it's quite a different thing to be unemployed, not knowing at all which businesses will come back, you know, and then being thrust into this jobless recovery, if there's ever recovery. I can't ask you to spin the, you know, sort of crystal ball on that, but maybe talk just, you know, a little bit about how inadequate and unprepared the um, large holes in our shredded safety net really are compared to say elsewhere in terms of dealing with this massive and sudden drop in employment? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, There was a a report that came out recently from the NELP, the National Employment Law Project, uh, just pointing out that since the 2008 crisis, um, there's been a really Uh, terrible development, which is that um, a lot of states have really made it a lot harder to access unemployment insurance. So it was already the case in 2008 that the U.S. uh, had a very low recipiency rate, which means that the share of unemployed people who actually got unemployment insurance benefits was low compared to a lot of other um, wealthy countries. And since that time, they haven't made it easier to gain access. They've actually made it harder. And that's, of course, because a lot of states, um, on the one hand, they faced really strong budget constraints. And instead of increasing their budgets, they have uh, reduced the payout of benefits. And then on the other hand, we just live in a country that takes a very punitive um, position on the poor. And so the other thing that we're seeing now that I've just been doing a little bit of research on is the state of food banks in America, because I think that's a very Mm -hmm. clear um, uh, indication of where American families are at. Um, There are some videos circulating online of just miles long uh, Mm -hmm. lines of cars uh, outside of Pittsburgh or in Pittsburgh going to food banks and similar kind of reports coming from other areas in the country. Uh, There's a real need on the part of families for immediate relief and a concern that the food bank infrastructure, which feeds those people, is not really going to be able to handle uh, the surge that's now coming. So the situation looks really bad. And um, I think, unfortunately, that it's probably going to get worse. And it's just terrible to imagine um, or to 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 live in a country also where people's uh, access to health care often comes through their jobs and for people to be losing access to health care 
in the midst of a pandemic, it's just a kind of, I mean, it's an insane economy. And I think a lot of the uh, relevant insanities are really being revealed now very clearly. And something else, Aaron, you just, you know, talking about the state of the food banks, and I saw another such long line in Arizona. Uh, and there's this is, you know, being repeated throughout the country. And we should remember that food banks are charity, right? Food yeah. bank is not state-sponsored aid in any way, shape, or form, and we're not seeing that. And even there, you know, we began to talk about uh, the sudden surge in unemployment and insur- uh, people filing for unemployment and how, um, you know, efficient or inefficient this is. People that I've talked to say it's you can do it online, but it's not easy. And you have to bring up documents and you have to have all sorts of things to prove you're worthy in a sense. Right. And, and, and we're dealing in a, in a catastrophic emergency situation that we don't know how long is going to continue. And I wondered if you could just, you know, you know, talk about it because you write a lot about precarity and here everybody's precarious. Right. And in a sense, I think what you've been saying is that the U S has been precarious for a long time and Europe is now catching up. Um, yeah. And so maybe you could just say a few words about, you know, that situation. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that I would like to write a little bit more about in the future that I, I do write about in my book is just the extent to which over the past uh, 20 years, especially European countries have made really significant moves to uh, reduce the security of their workers, especially young workers, labor market entrants, and job losers um, are being forced to find jobs where uh, employment protections are much lower and jobs that are temporary or on limited contracts of other kinds or part-time. And in the U.S., you know, it's interesting. We don't have really nearly as many workers uh, in jobs like that um, because in the U.S., all workers, except for unionized workers, are already precarious. They're hired at will, and they can be fired at will. And what that means is that, um, and this is unlike in Europe, where many workers with permanent full-time positions, they really are permanent in the sense that it's very hard to uh, evict workers from their jobs once they obtain them. In this country, it's incredibly easy to fire workers, and we're just seeing that obviously play out now. Uh, very rapidly as the U.S. economy adjusts to a major shock to demand by just releasing tons of workers out of the economy, um, and so it's it's a very uh, it's just a it's just an incredibly difficult situation. And like I said, if the past is any guide to the future, it's going to take a very long time uh, for the recovery to come. And so I think that the the really relevant question is, you know, what kinds of unrest are we going to be seeing in the next uh, year and whether that will begin before the pandemic conditions are, are sort of contained or, or whether, um, whether we'll have to wait until after. But I think we're going to see a really um, devastating and lasting employment situation in this country for a long time. Well, given that, Aaron Beninoff, can you talk a little bit about the CARES package, that is what the measures are so far that have been put into place to eat and how you think that they may either improve or worsen the situation and what it does, for, for example, specifically in terms of uh, unemployment insurance and then, you know, anything about sustain, are there any penalties or other things in place mm-hmm. where pe- where employers are being told they have to sustain these jobs. I mean, we we have, on the one hand, prescriptions from the government and then what we're seeing in reality, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, I think it'll be a little longer, right, before we really know how it plays out. Um, I think my concern, which is a concern of many people, I saw Sarah Nelson from the airline uh, uh, flight attendants union um, uh, making a similar point that a lot of these companies have spent the past decade engaging in uh, share buybacks and paying out big dividends and really running their companies on a very streamlined um, basis and taking on often a lot of debt as well to, to pay out their shareholders. And that's put them in a very weak position now going into this crisis. And we have this major corporate bailout that seems to have very few conditions attached to it. And it it just seems very difficult to know whether um, 
the U.S. government will be able to coax these companies into hiring back workers. It seems like all of the uh, the past uh, stimulus that the U.S. has the U.S. Uh, corporate sector has gotten has led to very very slow reuptake of labor, uh, and that's why I think it's interesting to think about or to to begin to imagine first of all what it would take to actually resolve this situation for working people in a more timely way. Uh, what kind of proposals would achieve that, and whether and what kind of political pathways are are at all open to those kind of solutions being implemented? Because it's not the one that we have so far. It's not the CARES Act that's going to do that. Right. Aaron Bedenoff, thanks so much. We've run out of time, but clearly uh, we'll revisit this and we'll look at uh, whether or not the projections you might have in mind match you know, what we see in the next, say, year or even further down the road. But I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Aaron Beninoff is a researcher. He's right now at the University of Chicago, soon to be, hopefully, in Berlin. And his uh, book that will come out in October from Verso is called Automation and the Future of Work. We have been talking about an article that you can find at phenomenalworld.com by Aaron Beninov, and it's called Crisis and Recovery. Thanks so much for joining us today, Aaron Beninov. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Susie Wiseman. This is Jacobin Radio. Thanks to producer and director Alan Minsky and to Jacobin Radio's Micah Utrecht. Bhaskar Sunkara is the founder and editor of Jacobin Magazine. And special thanks to Robert Brenner. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Susie Wiseman.